In 2014, the Obama administration announced a massive project to change the way policing is done in America. At the Department of Justice, they pledged to, quote, build community trust, retraining officers in catchphrase-friendly concepts like implicit bias and procedural justice. And they focused on a handful of pilot cities, Birmingham, Alabama, Gary, Indiana, Fort Worth, Texas, and Minneapolis. We all know how that went. Alex Vitale is the author of The End of Policing, and he's sort of the intellectual grandfather of a movement you've probably heard a lot about lately, defund the police. So in, in the wake of Ferguson and the murder of Tamir Rice and, and Eric Garner and the death of Sandra Bland in police custody, we were told, don't worry, we're, we're going to fix it. We got a plan. And these reforms were mostly ridiculous and had no possibility of working because they completely misunderstand the nature of the problem. It's a line of thought that springs almost organically from the experiences of millions of black Americans who've experienced abuse and violence from cops all their lives. For some, it means exactly what it sounds like, get rid of all police. For Vitaly, it means recognizing the police for what they are and asking a lot less of them. What we need to understand is that policing, even when it does everything right, is a tool of violence and social control and should always be understood as a deeply problematic institution. And any time we turn a problem over to them, we are inviting that violence into our lives. And so that really can't be reformed, ultimately. Does that mean that there are, there's a future you can see where there are no police in the city? Well, I'd certainly like to see such a future. I mean, I think we'd all like to live in a world where public safety isn't achieved by people with guns and by putting people in cages. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. The, the question is, how do we get there? So what a lot of people are doing is thinking about and working with communities to identify what are the specific public safety challenges that they face that maybe have been turned over to police or that the police have not been able to address effectively. Is it an that there's an opioid overdose crisis, that there's a problem of youth violence, that there's people with mental health crises wander, wandering the streets. Is it a problem of car break-ins, burglaries, whatever it is, let's put that on the table and start trying to address it. Why are we using police to manage our mental health problems? Put that way, it's not such a radical idea. In fact, it's something a lot of cops have even advocated for. Cops often complain they don't want to be social workers or addiction counselors. It might also be thought of as a long overdue rebalancing. In New York City, the police budget has gone up 22% over the last five years. It's now nearly $6 billion, more than what the city spends on health, homeless services, and workforce programs combined. Other cities, like Oakland and Chicago, spend around 40% of their discretionary funds on policing. And even when cities cut, they often spare the police. The Washington, D.C. mayor's proposed budget for 2021 reduced spending by $166 million, while adding $1.7 million for the police. Still, defunding the police remains a long shot. City councils that have endorsed the idea say they aren't quite sure how they'd go around implementing it. Meanwhile, the Democratic nominee for president, Joe Biden, remains faithful to the idea that one thing that shouldn't be taken away from cops is the job of fixing themselves. On Wednesday, he announced a plan to give the police an additional $300 million to build community trust. 